Oh, that's fine. One second. This is the blue cord. You might recognize. We've been here for this for a while. Reading to myself. Reading. Reading Japanese. Ricket with the top. Charles Perrault. Once upon a time, there was a queen who gave birth to a son so ugly and misshapen that for a long time everyone doubted if he was in fact human. A fairy who was present at his birth asserted everyone, however, that he could not fail to be pleasant because he would have a great deal of intelligence. She added that he would have the ability to impart the same amount of intelligence to the person he came to love by virtue of this gift she was giving him. All this somewhat consoled the poor queen, who was very much distressed at having brought such a hideous little monkey into the world. Sure enough, as soon as the child was able to talk, he said a thousand pretty things. Furthermore, there was an indescribable air of thoughtfulness in his actions that charmed everyone. I have forgotten to say that he was born with a little tuft of hair on his head, and this was the reason he was called Griquet with the Tuft, Griquet being the family name. At the end of seven or eight years, the queen of a neighboring kingdom gave birth to two daughters, the first of them more beautiful than daylight, and the queen was so delighted that people feared her great joy might cause her some harm. The same fairy who had attended the birth of little Riquette with the tuft was also present on this occasion, and to moderate the queen's joy, she declared that this little princess would be as stupid as she was beautiful. The queen was deeply mortified by this, but a few minutes later, the chagrin became even more still, for she gave birth to a second child, who turned out to be extremely ugly. Don't be too upset, madam, said the fairy to her. Your daughter will be compensated in another way. She'll have so much intelligence that her lack of beauty will hardly be noticed. May heaven grant it, replied the queen. But isn't there some way to give a little intelligence to my older daughter, who is so beautiful? I can't do anything for her, madam, in air of any writ, said Fairy, but I can do a great deal in matters of beauty, since there's nothing I would not do to please you. I shall endow her with the ability to render any person who pleases her with a beautiful or handsome appearance. As these two princesses grew up, their qualities in the same proportion Throughout the realm, everyone talked about the beauty of the older daughter and the intelligence of the younger. It is also true that their defects greatly increased as they grew older. The young daughter became uglier, the older, and more stupid every day. The, she entered, either gave no answer when addressed, or she said something foolish. At the same time, she was so awkward, she could not place four pieces of china on a mantle without breaking one of them, nor drink a glass of water without spilling half of it on her clothes. Despite the great advantages of beauty in the older sister, the younger sister always outshined the elder whenever they were in society. At first, everyone gathered around the more beautiful girl to admire her, but soon after for the more intelligent sister to listen to the thousand pleasant things she said. In less than a quarter hour, not a soul would be standing near the elder sister, while everyone would be surrounding the younger. Though very stupid, the elder sister noticed this and would have willingly given up all her beauty for half the intelligence of her sister. The queen, discreet though she was, could not help reproaching the elder daughter whenever she did stupid things, and this made the poor princess ready to die of grief. 
One day, when she was withdrawn into the woods to bemoan her misfortune, she saw a little man coming towards her. He was extremely ugly and unpleasant, but he was dressed in a magnificent attire. It was young Riquette with the tuft. He had fallen in love with her from seeing her portraits, and he had been sent all around the world as he has left his father's kingdom to have pleasures of seeing and speaking to her. Delighted to meet her thus alone, he approached her with all the respect and politeness imaginable. After praying usual compliments, he remarked that she was very melancholy. I cannot comprehend, madame, he said, how a person so beautiful as you can be so sad as you appear. Though I may boast of having seen an infinite number of lovely women, I can assure you that I've never one beheld one whose beauty could begin to compare with yours. It is very kind to you to say so, sir, replied the princess, and there she stopped. Beauty is a great advantage, continued Riquette, that it ought to surpass all other things. If one possesses it, I don't see anything that could cause one much distress. I'd rather be as ugly as you and have intelligence, said the princess, than be as beautiful and stupid as I am. There is no greater proof of intelligence, man, than the belief that we do not have any. It is nature's gift that the more we have, the more we believe we are in deficiency of it. I don't know what's that the case, the princess said, but I know full well that I am very stupid, and that's the cause of the grief which is killing me. If that's all that's troubling you, madam, I can really put an end to your distress. And how do you intend to manage that? The princess asked, I have the power, madam, to give as much intelligence to anyone as person to the person I love, Riquette said with the tuft, replied, and as you are that person, madam, it will be dependent entirely on whether or not you want to have so much intelligence, for you may have it, provided that you consent to marry me. The princess was thunderstruck and did not say a word. I see that this proposal torments you, and I'm not surprised, said Riquette with the tuft, but I'll give you a full year to make up your mind. The princess had so little intelligence, and at the same time she had such a strong desire to possess a great deal, that she imagined the young year would never come to an end, so she immediately accepted his offer. No sooner did she promise that she would marry Riquette with the tuft twelve months from that day, then she felt a complete change come over her. She found she possessed an incredible facility to say anything she wished and to say it in a polished yet easy, natural manner. She commenced right away, maintaining an elegant conversation with the prince. Indeed, she was so brilliant that he believed that he had given her more wit than he had kept for himself. When she returned to the palace, the court was at a loss to account for such an extraordinary change. Whereas she had formerly said any number of foolish things, now she made sensible and exceedingly clever observations. The entire court was beyond belief. Only the younger sister was not quite pleased, for she no longer held the advantage of intelligence over her elder sister. Now she merely appeared as an ugly woman by her side, and the king let himself be guided by the elder daughter's advice. Sometimes he even held meetings of his council in her apartment. The news of this change spread abroad, and all the young princesses of the neighboring kingdoms exerted themselves to the utmost to gain her affection. Nearly all of them asked her hand in marriage, but since she found none of them successfully intelligent, she listened to them without promising herself to anyone in particular. At last, a prince arrived who had so witty and handsome that she could not help feeling but attracted to him. Her father noticed this and told her that at perfect liberty to choose a husband for herself and that she had only to make her discretion known. Now, the more intelligence one possesses, the greater difficulty ha has in making up one's mind about weighty matters. So she thanked her father and requested some time to think it over. By chance, she took a walk in the same woods where she met Riquette with the Tuft to ponder the greater freedom and what she would do. While she was wake, walking, deep in thought, she heard the rumble beneath her feet, as though many people were running busily back and forth. Listening more attentively, she heard voices say, Bring me that cooking pot, 
give me that kettle, put some wood on fire. And at the same moment, the ground opened, and she saw what below appeared to be a large kitchen full of cooks, scullions, and all sorts of servants necessary for preparation of a magnificent banquet. A group of approximately 20 or 30 cooks came forth, and they took places at a very long table set in a path of the woods. Each had a larding pin in his hand and a cap on his head, and they set to work, keeping time to a melodious song. Astonished at this sight, the princess inquired who had hired them. Recount with the tuft, madam, the leader of the group replied. His marriage is to take place tomorrow. The princess was even more surprised than she was before, and suddenly she recalled that it was exactly a year ago she had promised to marry Prince Riquet with the tuft, how she was taken aback. The reason why she had not remembered the promise that she had made of it, she had still been a fool, and after receiving her new mind, had forgotten all her follies. Now no sooner had she advanced another thirty steps on her walk when she encountered Riquet with the tuft, who appeared gallant and magnificent, like a prince about to be married. As you can see, madame, he said, I've kept my word to the minute, and I have no doubt that you've come here to keep yours, by giving me your hand. You'll make me happier than the happiest of men. Um, is this not good? To be frank with you, the princess replied, I have yet to make up my mind on that matter, and I don't believe I'll be able to ever to do so to your satisfaction. You astonish me, madam. I believe it, the princess responded. And assuredly, if I had to deal with a stupid person, a man without intelligence, I'd feel greatly embarrassed. A princess is bound by her word, he'd say to me. And you must marry me as you promised to do. But since a man with whom I'm speaking is the most intelligent man in the world, I'm certain he'll listen to reason. As you know, when I was no better than a fool, I could not decide whether I should marry you. Now I have the intelligence that you've given me, and that renders me much more difficult to please than before. How can you expect me to make a decision today that I couldn't make then? If you seriously thought of marrying me, you made a big mistake in taking away my stupidity and enabling me to see clearer. If a man without intelligence would be justified in reproaching you for your breach of promise, Riquet with a tough replied, Why do you expect, madame, that I should not be allowed to do the same? This matter affects the entire happiness of my life. It is reasonable that intelligent people should be placed at a greater disadvantage than those who have none. Can you presume this, who you have so much intelligence, that to have so earnestly desired to possess it? But let us come to the point, if you please. With the exception of my ugliness, But let us come to the point, if you please. With the exception of my ugliness, is there anything about me that displeases you? Are you dissatisfied with my birth, my intelligence, my temperament, or my manners? Not in the least, replied the princess. I admire you for everything you've just mentioned. If so, Riquet with the truck responded, I'll gain my happiness. For you have the power to make me the most pleasing of men. How can that be done? If you love me sufficiently to wish that it should be, and to remove your doubts, you should know that the same fairy who endowed me at power with the birth to give intelligence to the person I chose also gave you the power to render handsome any man who pleases you. If that's so, the princess said, I wish with all my heart that you may become the most charming and handsome prince in the world. No sooner had the princess pronounced these words than Riquet with the tuft appeared to her eyes as the most handsome, strapping, and charming man she had ever seen. There are some who assert that it was not the fairy's spell, but love alone, that caused the transformation. They say that the princess, having reflected on her lover's perseverance, prudence, and all the good qualities of his heart and mind, no longer saw the deformity of his body, nor the ugliness of his features. His hunch appeared to her nothing more than the effect of a man shrugging his shoulders. Likewise, his horrible limp appeared to be nothing more than a slight sway that charmed her. They also said that his eyes, which squinted, seemed to her only more brilliant for the proof they gave of the intensity of his love. Finally, his great red nose had something material and heroic about it. However that may be, the princess promised to marry him on the spot, provided that he obtained the consent 
of the king, her father. On learning of his daughter's high regard for Riquet with the Tuft, whom he also knew to be a very intelligent and wise prince, the king accepted him with pleasure as a son-in-law. The wedding took place the next morning, just as Briquette with the Tuft had planned it. Moral. That which you see written down here is not so fantastic because it's quite true. We find that when we love is wonderfully fair, in what we love we find intelligence too. Another moral. Nature very often places beauty in an object that amazes, yet such that art can never achieve, yet even beauty can't move the heart as much as that charm hard to chart, a charm which only love can perceive. Translated by Jack Sipes.